this is Eric Brooking from Brooking Vineyards and welcome to another vineyard vlog. So you've decided to plant a vineyard. Uh, in last week's uh, trellising uh, system we kind of went over the hardware of how to install your vineyard. Uh, but now you need to decide uh, what type of grapes do you want to grow. Many people choose their favorite wine. Uh, I've had friends down here in San Diego County plant Pinot Noir because it's their favorite wine. But how many Pinot Noirs do you want to drink that came from the south of Spain, let's say, from Jerez? Um, the problem is, is that not all varietals grow well in every environment. Matter of fact, none do. You need to pick the right varietal for your environment, for your climate. This is a really great resource. I highly recommend it. Uh, wine Grape Varieties in California. It's put out by the University of California Agriculture and Natural Resources. You can look up the Winkler region that you're in and that'll help you to determine what type of varietal would work best for you. Uh, use a resource like the book that I showed you that covers different varietals. It'll tell you what the uh, best Winkler regions are to uh, grow that varietal in. You don't want to plant your favorite grape in an inferior environment because it'll never make great wine. The varietals that do best in different Winkler uh, climate areas are very important also because it determines whether or not you can ripen. Uh, the Winkler scale is based on how many degree days there are. So it's basically the, the growing season and how many days are above 50 degrees uh, Fahrenheit and by how much. Uh, it's actually an integration over time, but uh, needless to say, it's basically a, a culmination of how much heat you have in your area. And if you choose a varietal that grows better in North Africa and you're in uh, Oregon, you're not going to have enough heat to ripen your grapes. So you'll never get the sugar content and the acid will be extremely high, basically unripe grapes. But if it's the other way around, if you plant Pinot Noir down where I live, then you have too much heat and they ripen too fast and they become fruit bombs. They become very sweet without the acidic structure. Uh, you don't develop the flavors properly within the grape. So Pick your varietals very carefully for your environment. Another thing I think is helpful when choosing a varietal is to determine what style of wine you want to make and plant a couple of different types of varietals that can help you complement that style of wine. So if you choose one varietal for its fruitiness uh, but it lacks uh, tannic structure, then maybe you want to plant a little Nebbiola or some other uh, varietal that will help give you a little tannic backbone. Uh, picking and choosing your varietals based on your planned wine style is uh, a smart way to go. The next thing that you need to do is to select a rootstock that you want to grow on, and that depends a lot on your soil. Um, your soil will uh, either be high in clay, high in sand, rocky, good drainage, poor drainage. Uh, you may have a lot of salt like I do in this area. Um, so just depending upon the characteristics of your soil, you can use uh, books or you can go to different websites and see the benefits of different rootstocks. Also, it depends a lot on uh, what uh, rootstocks are available. Uh, when I like to buy from Nova Vine. Nova Vine is my favorite supplier for grape vines, 
and they will have uh, the varietal that you're looking for and it'll usually be on two or three different root stocks and you just need to check those two or three and pick the one that works best for your environment. In my Muscat Canale vineyard I've uh, chosen to go ahead and plant on uh, their own native roots. There's a gamble with that. Uh, some people feel that it produces a superior grape, the flavor's better, but you are wide open uh, for phylloxera, which is a little bug that actually lives on the roots and will kill all your grapevines. Here in Vista, in the North County of San Diego, uh, we don't have any phylloxera yet. So this is the gamble that I'm taking uh, to, to try to grow a, a vine with more flavor. But um, if somebody from up north takes a tour and walks through my vineyard, I could get phylloxera. Uh, and once that's uh, set in, it's, uh, it's pretty much done for. So hopefully we'll see these Muscat Canale grapes growing for a long time. But if I do get phylloxera, I'll have to replant. So that's a gamble you need to take. Uh, my Tempranillo and my Zinfandel are all on rootstocks. And so they're uh, more resistant to phylloxera and other types of diseases. Uh, these are things you need to, to think about. Also, some rootstocks are better for drought tolerance. Um, and that, especially nowadays, that's becoming a bigger deal. Um, I'm actually on city water here. I don't have an agricultural discount for my water. So uh, drought resistant rootstock is a good thing. Prepping the soil before you plant uh, is very important also. Uh, what you want to do is take and dig holes uh, periodically throughout the vineyard at different areas, different positions, uh, and take samples at one foot, two foot, and three foot. Bag them up and send them to the lab. Uh, depending upon the analysis, you can determine what you need to do to your soil. My tests here revealed that we were pretty good in all of our minerals. Uh, the only problem here was sodium uh, in the form of salt. So what we had to do was actually come in. Uh, I prefer to uh, use a two-man auger to drill holes where each vine will go. I'd say four or five good handfuls of gypsum down each hole. And then spread gypsum down the rows as well. Try to get a lot of gypsum on this dirt and then flood it with water it's uh, an expensive proposition when you're hooked up to city water, but you really need to flush the gypsum down through the soil to convert as much of the sodium chloride into calcium chloride uh, that you can. Uh, afterwards, then you can go ahead and plant. But I do not suggest putting um, uh, potting soil, fertilizers, extra things like this into the holes because what you do is you just make a real happy area for the roots to just become root bound. You end up with just a big ball of roots right in that one spot. So I drill down and plant an average of 18 inches deep. And then in the first year, I'm adding water. In other words, I put the dripper directly over each vine and keep those roots wet all year long. When we get to winter, I'll go ahead and I'll shut the water off. Then the next year, I move the emitter in between the vines so that I'm applying water away from the roots. And this encourages the root system to grow out wider. You want to get that root system as wide as possible so that you can store more carbs during the winter or actually just entering winter. You want to store up those carbs so that uh, the next year you have a great crop. I like to put drippers on that are pressure compensated and drip at one gallon per hour. At that drip rate uh, in this vineyard, I, because it has a little more clay than the other vineyard, I need to 
dig out some little basins to kind of catch the water. You want to make sure that you apply enough to fill the soil profile. So what you don't want to do is get in the habit of watering three times a week, five gallons each time, something like that. It's much better to wait a full week or maybe two weeks and then put on all the water at once and fill that profile completely. When you first plant, you use these little bamboo canes to help hold your vine straight up. It's good to try to tie them off with green tape. Try to keep the trunk as straight as possible. This one's a little too curved. You can see the little wire clip that you can get that'll hold it to the fruiting wire. And that'll help keep your vine straight. This is a little better. You really want to try to keep those trunks straight only because it looks nice, really. After the first year, you need to train your vines. My Tempranillo and Zinfandel, I like to unilaterally train that. So I take that initial shoot that has grown up and I just bend him over, point him to the south, just bend him over, tie him on. Uh, you have to be careful when you bend them. I like to bend just a little bit here, 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 just kind of across the radius and then tie them on. Uh, if you do a unilateral, which theoretically has a better guaranteed connection to the tap roots, uh, although there's a great deal of debate about that. But if you do that, you need to make sure that you don't have too much vigor in the first year because your node spacing will be too wide. And that means that your spurs for the you know, next foreseeable few years are going to be too wide, too far apart and you're not going to uh, get enough production out of your vines. You want to make sure that you just about get a fist, maybe just a little more than a fist in between nodes, which will become shoots next year, which become your spurs that you're continuously growing uh, your shoots from in a VSP uh, type setup. Here in the Muscat Canal, I'm doing uh, cane pruning, and so it's not as critical. But if you are getting ready to train those vines, uh, don't put too much nitrogen in the soil. The vigor will be too much, and then your node spacing will, will wreck your uh, spur placement for later, for years to come. Our first stage coming out of dormancy was bud break. Uh, then we had shoot growth, and the flowers were put on. And right now we're waiting for bloom when those flowers open up and small little white or yellow flowers appear on these very fine stems that stick out. It's really interesting. Shoot growth here in our vineyard was extremely fast this year. Uh, we had a lot of rain and then we had really warm, warm weather and things took off fast. I'll try to show a time lapse of the growth. As your shoots are growing, you need to come in and trim off uh, any excess ones. Uh, any of them that don't have flowers on them aren't going to produce fruit. Um, unless you have a dead area in your grapevine, which you would like to have some leaves in there doing photosynthesis and producing carbs, at least for the root system. Any shoots that go down off the bottom of the cordon, uh, you'd like to pull off. Any suckers like this that are growing along the trunk, you want to just pull off. They pull off very easily. Also, any shoots coming off the bottom, you can pull off. See this shoot, it doesn't even have any fruit at all on it. And it comes from the bottom of the cordon, so you want to get rid of that. Some areas are more sparse than others, and so I'll go ahead and leave a shoot in there that doesn't produce anything, just to keep it filled in, and it'll make a nice spur for next year. But then there are other areas where you get an overgrowth. And in here, I'm going to need to thin this out. 
and pull out anything that isn't producing fruit. Well, I think that's about it for this vlog entry. Uh, I hope you're enjoying the vlog. Um, I know I like talking about it and helping you out. It's, it's really interesting to uh, you know, learn about and decide how to plant your vineyard. There are a lot of choices and there's no one way to do it right. Uh, there's always different alternatives. Please do your homework, pick the right varietal that'll do the best for you in your environment. Do the right wine style, take care of your grapes, grow the best vineyard that you can, and that'll make your winemaking a lot simpler. My next vlog is going to be about uh, bloom time. And what we're gonna wanna do then is to go ahead and take a petiole analysis. So we'll take a sample of petioles. But we'll get to that in the next vlog. I've had some problems with the comment section, but if you do have a question or if you've asked a question in one of the comments and I haven't uh, answered it, haven't addressed it yet, go ahead and call me up or send me an email. Mm -hmm.